Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence. In the name of Jesus, right now, I sanctify this pulpit, God. This stage, this altar, this sanctuary. Lord, I'm here to say what you said to say. So I pray that your people are here to hear what you want to say. He that had ears, let him hear. And he who will not hear, let him be deaf still. Let your word find root and that root bear fruit. Prepare us, O oh God, for your presence. Prepare us for your coming. Prepare us for your manifest glory. Prepare us, O oh God, for holy ground. Prepare us for miracle signs and wonders. But most of all, prepare us to see your face, O oh God. Prepare us to know you and encounter you and experience you and love you. And Father, we thank you because, because you're such a good father to us. You're a good, good father. I love you, Lord, and I thank you because... You let us be exactly who we are for the honor and glory of your holy name. You've created us vessels, and each vessel is different. And I thank you for the differences in all the vessels. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you sit today, we're going to read from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting from verse 38. probably the most common scripture in all of the word but it's what the Lord wouldn't let me forget for the last four days then Saul gave David his own armor a bronze helmet and a coat of mail David put it on strapped a sword over it and took a step or two to see what it was like for he had never worn such things before I can't go in these he protested to Saul I'm not used to them so David took them off again He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into a shepherd's bag. And then, armed with only his shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked out towards David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog? He roared at David. That you come at me with a stick. And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come here, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals, Goliath yelled. And David replied to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then... I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle and he will give you to us. As Goliath moves closer to attack, David ran quickly out to meet him, reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone. He hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. And the stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. And so David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. And the word of the Lord to the church today is, what's that stone for? That's it. It's a question. What's that stone for? And we get to answer it because not every stone is to slay a giant. Not every stone that we're carrying is to slay a giant. And God is, is asking us the question today, what's it for? You may have your seats. I can't speak for the rest of the world, but I had a grand time on Sunday. Drizzle and all. I really did. I um, apologize for the weather. I tried my best. And I think God did a great job by pushing it back enough. Um... The very first time we did the parade, it rained. And um, it was a very, very sad day for me. Very sad. Not because of the rain. But it rained that day and I cried the whole route. And we were stupid back then. Okay, we weren't stupid. We were less conscious. Yeah. <laughs> more ignorant. And we started this parade on 101 Avenue. We walked 101 Street and walked 47, 43 blocks 
because we were crazy. Eight and a half hours later, as we pulled into our church, it was late. It was really, really late. And we realized, you can imagine dance, the dancers need to answer this. You can imagine dancing for 42 blocks. It was all Roots idea. <laughs> no, it was a collective idea, right? And, um, and I, I, I realized today that, um, I can't tell you the whole story, but um, because it's not my story to tell, but that day, I didn't know where my brother was. I didn't know where on the earth. I was waiting for him to come home, but I didn't know. And, um, and so we started, um, that's not helping me, right? The worst thing when you're crying is sad background music, man. You ain't never going to stop. Am I telling the truth or am I telling the truth? <laughs> but thanks, it was pretty. <laughs> and so I was waiting for, we were waiting to see, you know, when he would come home and we didn't know where he was. And um, I remember when they started playing his song and, um, and, That's better. <laughs> and, and I heard his song, but I couldn't see his face. It was the worst feeling in the world. And um, so he came, I, he did come home shortly after that. We've, we, we, it was a celebration for us. And, um, and the rain fell and I cried the whole way, but nobody knew because the rain fell. And the rain hit my tears, right? So this Sunday, when I walked in the parade and the rain fell, it was impossible for me to be sad. It was impossible. I was so happy. I danced the whole way. When I got home, my feet were barking like dogs. <laughs> like, what did you do? Because them cheap boots I was wearing. I walked around like eight times, you know? Because I was so excited, I didn't need coffee. I had so much adrenaline in me and, and so much joy and so much laughter. You know why? Because I walked 10 times that route in tears, in pain before, in the rain before. This time, it was different. Yeah. Marky came up to me afterwards and he showed me a picture and he said, do you know why I will never miss a parade? And I said, why? And he, said, he showed me a picture of, of me and um, my brother and him and he said, that's why. Because we know what it is to have your joy be full and to not let stupid little things cause you to lose your joy when those are things that are irrelevant like who shows up or or who agrees or what the weather looks like and so the Lord really showed me that that experience I wouldn't trade it for the world I'm, I would trade uh, you know some things about it but I wouldn't trade the hurt because the hurt facilitated the joy. Because I knew what it felt like to grieve like that, no small things like a, a thunderstorm or a, or a blizzard can't, make me, can't bring me down because I have a stone for that. I, I have something that reminds me that God delivered me from something that could have 
crippled me and God has brought me to a better place and and the reason why I don't want to shout this is because I want you to take a minute to go back to that place in your life where you were so wounded and so hurt or so afraid that you thought it would never get better but then God made it better and it, it what it does it makes sure that you can't grieve over small stuff anymore because people like to stay in the place of grief people love to throw their own pity party and be the only attendee they try to drag you into attending and if you don't attend they'll just throw one for themselves but this is what God says he says forgetting those things which are behind let us press forward to the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. You know what God's saying? He's saying, yes, bad things are going to happen. But that becomes in your life a stone of remembrance. Remember what God told us once. That these boulders have sharp edges. The things that you've been through, they're dangerous. But what the word of God does is he takes the edges off like water. He takes the edges off the things that are supposed to kill you. And he turns it into the weapon in your hand. So on Sunday, I'm dancing down the the street because God has already turned this thing around God had already showed me that this is not the answer this this cloud over your head is not a bad thing this is a reminder that the same God who delivered you before will deliver you again and the same God that parted the Red Sea will again part the waters for you the same one that showed up in the middle of your fiery furnace is the same one who's still in the fire the same God who healed your body once will heal your body again the same God who provided what you need come Carlene come Marlon come Shiki let me tell you something these are living breathing walking testimonies that the same God that did it before can do it again this week this week he did it again can we just give God praise because he is the God of yesterday today and forever and he's worthy he's worthy he's worthy all three testified to me this week that God once more showed up and did the impossible when the enemy comes to try to scare you when the enemy what do you think Goliath was? He was a fear tactic. He was a scare tactic. All he had was noise. And sometimes the enemy comes with the noise. But let me tell you something. He might be loud. But all he's got is a bark. He has no bite. Because Jehovah Sabah will always come to the rescue of his children. That's what that stone is for. David didn't have much. All David had was a little bag. A shepherd's bag. And, 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 and you know, even yesterday as I was putting up the Christmas tree, my Christmas tree looks like Christmas vomit. <laughs> How many of you have like a real aesthetic Christmas tree? Put your hand up. You and I wouldn't get along for Christmas. We just wouldn't. Because, you know, like this beautiful tree here. That can't survive in my house. It can't. Right? My tree has every color God ever made and a few more. I have one ornament that looks like, like a, um, a plate of macarons. I literally do. I bought that in Paris. And then I have another one that looks like a tea set. Guess where I bought that? England. Correct. And then I have another one that looks like a little boat, which I bought in Maine. And then I have another one, which is just an old piece of wood that my dad painted. I have that on there. And then I have one that looks like a measuring tape. Because it reminds me of the parade. And then I have another. So I'm putting up those decorations. And I'm thinking, this is one ugly tree, boy. Whee! <laughs> but you know what? It's my tree. With my life on it. And every one of those things reminds me of what God did for me. Every single one of those things is a stone of remembrance that tells me that's where he took you. You weren't supposed to go there, but God took you there. According to this world, you didn't earn that. But God will give you what you don't. Can somebody talk about the God who will give you what you didn't deserve? And he's so gracious that he'll not give you what you do deserve. But those stones of remembrance on my tree are, are what make those, makes those trees, that tree, special to me. 
It might not mean anything to anybody else, but to me, I see my life on it, right? There's a little one that's a little crowned because Shuggy thought she was a princess when she was a baby. She still does, never mind. When she was a baby, she thought she was a whole princess, a whole one. So there's a tiara on my tree for her. And there's, there's different ones for the different members of my family on that tree. And there's a little Scrooge on there. Amen. <laughs> so to you, it's going to mean nothing. But to me, I can look back and see all the things that happened in my life. You see, the things that you carry might mean nothing to me. All the little things you carry in your bag that God has equipped you with will mean nothing to me. You going through what you did doesn't mean that much to me. But to you, it's a testimony of what God has brought you through. And sometimes we forget that God has already equipped us with a bag full of testimony. They look like little stones. They look like rocks. We think they're worth nothing. And to everybody else, they're worth nothing. But to you, Christelle, it's worth that God pulled you out of the wreckage of an earthquake that was supposed to kill you. And for you, God pulled you out of a deathbed. Has God given anybody a testimony that's worth remembering that you never want to forget? Don't throw away the stone just because you don't need it now this is what he said it gets heavy so we empty out the bag he said don't throw it away because you don't need it now sometimes God gives us a word and it's a stone it's a weapon it's small but it's a weapon and you're like well that don't apply to me Ooh. somebody say amen because you're in this church right now feeling that you're like, I don't know what she's talking about. I'm not sick. That don't mean nothing to me. And God's saying, just because you don't need it now, doesn't mean you don't put it in the bag for a later day. Don't throw away the word because you're not in that situation. Because as this world continues to turn, brother, there might be a day when you do need a gyra. There might be a day when you're calling on a Rafa. You might not need him today to be that God to you. But put the story in your shepherd's bag and keep walking with it because the word of God is alive mm. well my favorite are those who feel like your marriage is a match made in heaven and when we say you know you need to take that to the Lord for what God joined together no man can separate and you're like oh, we don't need that baby until the day you do and then you cry and then you weep because the princess had turned into the frog. <laughs> Pastor, but when I tried to give you the word, when I tried to say day by day, get on your knees together. When I tried to say you're the king of your house, you're the priest of your house, that word didn't apply to you because everything was going good. So you threw it away. God said, don't throw it away just because you think it don't apply. Keep it. There is nothing in the word of God that does not apply. Everything applies. It Listen, I get you. I get you. Some of you love medicine. You don't have a cough, but you preemptively drink a NyQuil. You don't have a cold, but you rub in Vicks like if it's going out of style. Some of you taking it so far, you swallow in Vicks. You can't eat that stuff. No matter what your grandpa told you. It's not edible. Lorenzo is like, what? And the name of the sermon is Don't Eat Vicks. <laughs> I get people like to take all kinds of, how many of you are pre preemptive med medicine takers? Oh my goodness. I'm not talking about like herbs and, you know, ginger and garlic and thing. I'm talking about people who want to take antibiotics and you got no biotics to be anti. <laughs> Don't do it. You know why? Let me tell you why. Because you'll build up an immunity to something that might save your life a little bit later on. What am I saying? Don't be crying wolf if you ain't sick. Oh. Yeah. Don't be telling God why you don't heal my body and you don't have no ailments. 
every time you get a little pain in your side Jesus why I'm going through this God said you're not sick don't act sick don't call sick don't be sick don't take the medicine if you I find that's a good word you know why because when you're really sick and you come for prayer sister Carlene ain't gonna believe you she's not gonna intercede like an intercessor she think is one of your fortnightly ailments. Wow, it's like flesh burning down this church. There's a stone for an occasion. And God is asking you, why did I give you that? Why is that in your bag? Why is that particular weapon in your repertoire? Why did God let you go through what, what he let you go through? You understand? There's a question that God's asking you. Don't think that these words, I, I get that hearing messages after messages at your age, they tend to all sound like the same message. But they aren't the same any more than a diamond and a rock are the same thing. There are three types of rocks in the world. Where is this coming from? God alone knows. Who knows it? I'll give you a dollar. Go ahead. They look at the two nerds in the corner over there. And two nerds over here. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. What are the three types? Igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. Is that what you were going to say? Close. What were you going to say? Oh, you didn't know metamorphic. Then don't put up your hand, Ethan. I know your name is not Ethan, but Ethan does the exact thing. You must get that from your papa. Right, those are the three different kinds of rock. And you know what makes them different? Who knows? How they're formed. Not so much. Where they're found. Yes, all, both of those are right, but that's not the most important thing. Well, what they're made of, also good. Pressure. All of you are so smart. You're so smart. What? I can't hear you. The texture. The way it looks and feels, she's right. That's all. The porosity and the texture is what, because all of these rocks, all rocks come from the same place. All rocks are formed, well, sedimentary and, and metamorphic rocks are lava. You know that, right? How many of you have granite countertops? Let me, let me blow, blow your bubble. Granite, you know, genuine granite. Granite is the cheapest thing you could put on your countertops. <laughs> It is available in very large quantities, very easy to find, and very cheap. The reason why you think it is expensive is because people who make kitchens made you think so. It's very readily available. Granite, right? You, 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 get over it. It's okay. <laughs> Sandstone is actually more expensive than granite. Slate, more expensive than granite. All of those things. Why am I telling you this? Because ju just because the three kinds of rock might look the same, all rocks fall into that. But Ruthie, something happens sometimes with some of those rocks that could change something that is worth a dollar to something that's worth a million dollars. And the only thing, when lava comes out from the hot places of the earth and dries up, that's how rocks are formed. But sometimes the pressure on that rock is so hard and so long and so much that it takes what could be just a cheap old rock and it pressurizes it under high heat until that thing becomes a diamond until that very rock becomes a quartz until that very rock becomes a ruby until it becomes something that shines it's transparent and becomes so clear that everybody desires it what is God saying he's saying you can pray that you get out of your situation or you can let me make of you what I'm trying to make of you you can I know the pressure's on I know you don't want to go to the furnace I know it's been too long but God said in the end you're gonna come out as gold I'm doing something on the inside of you that eventually is going to show on the outside of you. You're not going to be one facet. You're going to be multifaceted. You're going to be a person who knows how to be instant, in season, and out of season. There's nothing that the devil will be able to throw at you. 
that you can't handle. Why? Because there's a stone in the back for that. And God's saying, what is that for? Why did you go through it? If you would ask David, if you would ask David, what is that stone for? He would not have said to kill a bear, even though he already had. He would have not said to kill a lion, even though he already had done that. He wouldn't have said it's for wolves. And, and it, no, you know why? Because the Bible says after Goliath taunted him, he went to the river. Do you understand? Those five stones David picked up was for one purpose. And it was to kill a giant. David knew what he was looking for when he went to the brook. He was looking, the Bible said, for a smooth stone. He needed something that had already been polished by the water. Something that had been through a beating after many, many years. He needed something that was aerodynamic, that wouldn't be hindered by the wind of opposition. He needed something that when he put it in his sling and he let it go, it would hit its target. Maybe he might die in the end, but the stone would hit its target let me tell you something about the word of god it is sharp it is powerful and the washing of the word will cause you to never miss your target when the enemy comes at you you just reach down into the bag of your life experience and what god has brought you through and said it may be raining but i've got a stone for that i've been down this road before so here you go devil and let it fly just because the word today isn't for you today keep it tomorrow it'll be your word tomorrow tell me if ever you're driving down the road you put on an old sermon and it starts to speak to you in a way it didn't speak to you when it was released anybody you know what that is that's a stone in your shepherd's back you didn't kill a giant that day with it but it was in the back for the day when that particular giant came your way. You say, Pastor, it was like you were talking to me. I wasn't talking to you. He just put a stone in your bag for that moment. But sometimes we look at the stone and we don't want it. We want a sword. I don't want a smooth stone. I want a big, sharp sword. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? I don't want a little line. I want a whole chapter. I want the whole sermon to be about me from beginning to end. Except if she threw in something in my garden, then I'm gonna get upset. <laughs> you know many people call me up on a daily? Were you talking about us? No! I don't even know you. I don't have time to think about people when God's given me a word like that. All the stones are different, but they have something in common. They're all birthed in the deepest and hottest parts of the earth. Two, the hotter the pressure, the tougher the stone. The hotter the pressure, the tougher the stone. You want to know who to ask for prayers? You want to know who to ask to pray for you? Don't ask somebody who's been through nothing. Don't ask somebody who never saw a problem in their life just because she's sick it doesn't mean she doesn't know how to intercede for you if anybody knows it's somebody who's in the middle of the furnace that person knows don't disqualify yourself because you're still going through you know how to pray you've been praying for yourself so you know how to pray for the devil will come to tell you you can't pray for somebody's marriage if your marriage is falling apart that is a lie of the devil If anybody knows what those people feel like, it's you. If anybody knows what to ask for, it's you. If anybody knows how to pray for cancer to go, it's somebody who's been told they have it. If anybody knows how to pray for you to have a baby, it's somebody who never did. I saw on YouTube the other day, no TikTok. I was just there to see how many people hated me that day. It was literally 970,850, not even exaggerating. And 
they take stones, like regular old dirt stones, like, you know, and they put it in this thing called a tumbler. Anybody seen that? A stone tumbler. And then they put some kind of slush or something. And then they tumble that thing for 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours. And then when that stone, which was ugly and useless, comes out of the tumbler, it's shiny and smooth. And now it's semi-precious. That's what they're calling it, semi-precious. Why? Because it had a tumble. We want the precious without the tumble. We want to stay like we are and be called the jewels of Almighty God. But the Bible said when he comes to gather his jewels, he's looking for somebody who's a reflection of who he is. The only way that you get shiny enough to reflect him is in the tumble. And the longer you're in the tumbler, the shinier you get. These stones have been tumbled by life. And people want the shine of somebody else. You want his shine. But you don't want to go through what he's been through. You're mad at God because God's doing something in him. But you don't care to go through the hell he's been through. You want the hell. You want the, the holy without the hell. You want the reward, but you don't want to go through the ringer. And God's saying they've been in the tumbler. And that's why they come out the way they did. David picked up the right kind of stone. He picked up the stone to kill a giant. It's a tiny weapon in the hand of a really big God. This is what the Lord showed me. He said sometimes, if... I asked you guys, come, we're going to have a contest. Come pick a stone to fight with. You're going to look for the biggest one, right? Nobody's going to pick this little fella. Like, what are you going to do with this? Some of you can really cause some damage with this. Not me. I'm like maybe the weakest arm in this church. This stone, this stone doesn't look like it's a dangerous thing. Sometimes what God gives you is the smallest word. Seriously, we don't want the small word. We want hitherto and henceforth thou shalt go in and possess the land. And little by little, every enemy will. That's what we want. And what God gives us is a fear not. What am I going to do with a fear not? Be still and know. No weapon. His mercies are. By his stripes. God is good. His mercies endure. Lazarus. See? We don't want that. But the power in that is the power of agreement. Now listen. Everything I said that was a teeny tiny stone, you knew how to finish the sentence. You knew what it, mean, what it means when I say God is good. It ain't even in the Bible and you know it's all the time. And if I said all the time... See what I mean? And sometimes, Ruthie, all God needs to give you is this. Come here. God says, you're going to fight a battle? Here you go. This stone is no weapon. And people will look at you and say, but look at her. That's all she got. The Lord will look at her and say, no weapon. What's she supposed to do with no weapon? But if you are a giant slayer, you realize that no weapon is packed full of power. The no weapon means that no weapon that is ever formed against you shall prosper. And you won't despise the small beginning. You say, you see that no weapon? I'm putting that in my bag. Because one day, the enemy's going to form a weapon to take take you down and you'll reach for the stone and all it is is a little thing that says no weapon if God told me no weapon I'm keeping that I might not need it today but I'm gonna need it someday no weapon fear not Omi is like my favorite person for small stones every time Omi gets a small stone during the fast she panics Sure, sure. Yes, Omi, look at the scripture again. What does the scripture say? Fear not. Does that mean I actually have to fear? 
does that mean things are gonna happen and they're fearful? So God is telling me to fear not. I'm like, I'm like, no, Ohms. All it means is don't be afraid. No matter what. Am I telling the truth? Because when God tells you to fear not, what the enemy will do is cause that stone to look inadequate. He'll say, that's too small for fear. That's too small for giants. But God put this story in the book so that you would know you don't need a sword to take the giant down. All you need is a little word that's been tumbled by the Holy Spirit. A little fear not. You know what that means? I will fear no evil for thou art with me. That I I get it. You think fear not is when angels show up and say thou art highly favored. But it's also that. But it's not only that. Fear not when you go through the fire, I will be there with you. Fear not when you go through the water, you will not drown. Fear not even if they throw you in a lion's den, you will not be eaten alive. Fear not though an host may encamp around you, in this thing will you be confident. Fear not, you will not be suffering for food and you will never beg for bread. Fear not, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Fear not, a thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand. But it shall not come nigh their dwelling. Fear not before these things come to pass. The eastern sky is going to split open. And the trumpet of the Lord shall sound. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we who are alive. And rem fear not covers. Fear not is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fear not ask of me whatever you will and I will do it. What? Fear not is a big, big weapon packed in a small, small stone. What's God trying to say to you? We run, we run behind people to get a word. Don't we? Some of you come up to this altar and if pastor don't touch your head, you feel like you even get prayed for. And as much as I honor and appreciate that, God's saying, what's the stone I gave you for? Because today, somebody's going to get a word that seems too small for your problem. The giant's big. The weapon's little. God's saying it's enough. The giant is big. The weapon is little. And God's saying it's enough. I'll say it again. The debt is big. The seed is small. God's saying it's enough. The problem is massive. The solution looks tiny. God's saying it's enough. The vision is massive. Your provision is tiny. And God's saying it's enough. The issue is massive. Your effort is minuscule. And God's saying, what? I don't know why that doesn't excite everybody to the point where you're just busting out of every single cell in your body. You know why? All of a sudden, I'm, I'm reaching my hand into that bag that the Lord provided for me. Sometimes a stone looks like a dream. I've had dreams for 10 and 20 years that I keep in that bag because it didn't come to pass yet. But if he gave it to me, I'm putting that in there for the day that it comes to pass. I got dreams and they're not all good. But I know he's already given me solutions. He's already shown me avenues where he will show up. Let me tell you this. When Satan gets a hold of the stone, he will make you use it as a weapon against yourself. Because people are filling their, their bag with stones, but not for killing giants. Let me show you this in the word. In John chapter 8, hear what happened. Eh? This woman is caught in the act of adultery. The Bible says the very act. You know what that means? Anybody need explanations? The very act means she was very doing it when they caught her. And the scripture says in John 8, 7, so when they continue to ask him, these are the Pharisees, and they all have what in their hand? A what? Okay, let's get some Pharisees up here. Volunteer, come on, all you Pharisees. Grab a stone. The only people who will volunteer to be Pharisees are those who are not. 
All the Pharisees sitting down like, not me. Mm -mm. I don't even want them to presume I'm in that category. Somebody said, well, a big one. <laughs> In John, chapter, in John chapter 8 and verse 7, the Bible said that this woman is caught in the very act. That means they pulled her out of the bed. That means when they throw her in front of Jesus, she probably ain't wearing nothing. And all of the righteous men are ready to use the stone. I need you to see this. Sometimes the stone is not for killing a giant. Sometimes people use the word itself. For condemning the weak. That's what they were using it for. They weren't doing this because they were nasty people. They were doing this because the Moses word, the word of God through Moses said that if somebody is caught that way, they should be stoned. So that, you see how oh, that's still a stone? It's the word. But what they were going to use it for was to destroy somebody who was caught in weakness. Jesus intercepts this event, all right? So this is how it happened. They throw this naked woman, bam, in front. And these men are ready. Come on, show me your stone in posture. Wait, stop, freeze. Some of you like you do this before. <laughs> Hopefully not. And then they say, Jesus, come in. You want to be Jesus? Because you didn't want to be a Pharisee. They see Jesus coming, and now the Bible said they, in they intend to trap him. So one, the talker among the group. Who's the talker? Well, everybody knows Brian Dennis. <laughs> the talker says, you, you, tell us. Moses said that she should be stoned. What do you say? Now here they intend to trap Jesus with a stone. Listen to this. Look, they all have the stone to throw. And what they want him to do is to also pick up a stone to throw. What they want him to do is to use the word of God to condemn a weak person. But what they didn't know is he was a stone himself. The Bible said he was the stone that the builders rejected. The stone that the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. He was going to redefine stone once and for all. The Bible said, whosoever fell on the stone would be crushed into many pieces. But he on whom the stone would fall would be ground into powder. Don't ask the stone to pick up a stone. The Bible said he just started writing in the sand. What is he doing? Irritating them. Because people who want to use the word of God to condemn the weak are going to get very irritated. When you don't join in the condemnation instantly. But when you decide that you're going to show mercy, they're going to get really, really upset. But praise be to God that we serve the omniscient, gracious, merciful, forgiving God. The God who sees the intents of your heart. The God who knows every person inside and outside. And when the world tries to condemn you he stands up and utters the most beautiful words that she ever heard he said in effect you're right that is what Moses is where it says so go ahead and throw your stone if you have no sin Do you hear this? He says the word is true, but the only one authorized to throw a stone at someone is one who does not deserve a stone himself. And there's not a one of us here. Jesus said, yeah, you have authority. As long as you have never been the another, as long as you have never been in a place where you should have been in her position, go ahead and do it. And the Bible says, watch this. Huh? We get the impression that she and Jesus are left there alone, but that's not what happened. There's a multitude around them. Not everybody's condemning her, just some men. You know what they do? 
they drop the stone one by one, hear these words, and slip away. Sneaky stone carriers. <laughs> Woman, where are your accusers? Lord, apparently I don't have any. <laughs> and then the stone says, and I don't condemn you either. Go and What? He has the right to condemn her. He has the authority. He has every right to take a stone and throw it at her. And he waves his right. He says, I don't condemn you either. I waive the right to stone you. Why? Because he was bruised for her iniquity. She deserved it, so he was going to take it. Do you understand? Forever and ever, that woman had a stone to carry. Forever and ever, when they ask her, what is that for? She'd say, this is what was supposed to take me out. But nobody, nobody could cast a stone at me if he himself, the king of all creation, said, neither do I condemn you. Somebody in here needs to get free from that. Somebody watching me online, living in the condemnation of feeling that you don't have a place in the church because of what people say. I'm here to tell you that let he, that was that is without sin cast the first stone the words of the savior is i don't condemn you love him go and sin no more so people don't only use the stone as a testimony or for killing giants they use it to condemn the weaker but one more thing i want to tell you that satan does He'll make you use it as a weapon against yourself. Um, Mark 5.5 5 shows us this. There was a man named who used to live among the tombs. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. <clears throat> See? Cutting himself with stones. And I, I'm, I'm like, well, this is demon demonism, Lord, when the Lord showed me this. And he said, you don't understand. The enemy will cause you to take the word that God gave you and cut yourself with it. You will condemn yourself to the point where you're cutting. You're cutting yourself with it. Let me show you how that works. Mm. You can't read the Bible about tithing because you don't tithe. Right? In other words, you know that part that talks about tithing? You can't read it. You won't read it. And if you do, you gloss over it. Why? Because it will cut you. All right, let me get an, a less controversial one. You can't read about David and Bathsheba because you're living in adultery. Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying? You have never been guilty of like the part that applies to you in the word. You're going to gloss over it. I've done that. You know, I don't want to read about lying if I'm caught in a lie. No. All liars shall have their place in the lake. That's not what I'm feeling led to read today. You know what I mean? Anybody else but me? Why? Because that word cuts you. That, nobody has to preach it to you. You preach it to yourself. Yeah. If you are gossip goddess. You skip in the part in Revelation where the Bible says there's a place in hell for you. If you are a lover, lover of yourself and of money. You're not going to read that. You're, you're, if you're lazy and you don't work in the church at all, you're definitely not reading work, work while it is day because the night comes when no man shall work. My, where did my amens go? If you're a disobedient child, Ephesians 6 and 1 is elusive. You don't even know the Bible has an Ephesians chapter 6. Obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Parents like that one. It will cut you. 
and Legion was cutting himself. And the, the Lord said to me, that's what the enemy will take the stone that God provided for you and cause you to do with it. Instead of using it to slay the giant in your life, you use it to wound your own self because of the things that the enemy has caught you in. In the middle of tombs, in the middle of dead things, in the middle of a cemetery where all there is is dry bones and people who are void of the Holy Ghost and the anointing. That's where you'll cut yourself. The stone that the builder rejected made Legion drop the stone. The stone that the builder rejected made the Pharisees drop the stone. Amen. Stand with me. Tonight I heard the Lord say, and for those of you who will work in the altar for a few minutes today, he said he's going to give them. He's going to remind you of the, sh the weapons in your shepherd's bag. Because I'm not the only shepherd in the house. I'm one of them. But all of us, all of us were called. We're called to take care of the sheep of God. All of us have an arsenal. We all have a bag of weapons. And God's like, what are you using them for? Because not only are our weapons to slay giants... How do you slay the giant? Well, when the giant of doubt comes against you and says you will not be healed, that stone that says by his stripes will take that giant down. Amen. A million times, in, not a million, but many, many times in the Bible, Jesus asks people, he's like, do you believe? When the man at the pool of Salem, when, when, when the guy who's waiting for the water to be troubled to be healed, meets Jesus. Jesus didn't say, okay, the next time the angel troubles the water, I'm going to throw you in there. No, he didn't. The pool was now irrelevant because Jesus was there. That means that you don't actually have to know the circumstances under which your stone, that stone that God equipped you with is going to be. <laughs> That's so funny. You're funny. Some of you had a kidney stone. <laughs> And God said, even that was to equip you. Because the kind of pain that comes from that. I hear they say it's like having a baby. If you're a guy. God said to tell you tonight, the word that he will give you is to slay giants. But not only is it to slay giants. Listen to this. It's to raise up children. Because Jesus said, if you don't worship. The very stones, see those things, the very stones will rise up and worship God. The Pharisees used to say, we are children of Abraham. Jesus said, don't you know that God is able to raise up children of Abraham from those stones? What is God saying? He's saying those things that he's equipped you with, your life experiences, the troubles you've been through, the miracles that God has done, the lion's dens, the fiery furnaces and the red seas, those are what will give birth to children in the kingdom of God. Raise up children of Abraham. Instead of taking the stones and making your own little castle and sitting and crying about it, can you just tell somebody what God brought you through? Hallelujah. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these stones would hold their peace, if these children would hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. I don't know what God is preparing you for, but this is what he said. He said, it's time for some of you to start picking them up because you've dropped them along the way. Your hurt, your doubt, your pain, your trouble, your trauma has caused you to throw away what God gave you. It didn't look like enough. But in the book of Ecclesiastes, the Bible says there is a time to cast away stones and there is a time to gather them together. And the word of the Lord tonight is gather them together. Go back to what he had said to you. Hold on to it. Even though little, it is enough to slay your giants. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, oh God, that today you will equip us again, oh Father. Today, put in our, in our bag, in our shepherd's bag, all the things we need to defeat every giant in our lives. I thank you, God, that today, if you need a word from the Lord, even a small word, I want you to 
make your way up to this altar right now as quickly as you can and I believe that the Lord is going to reveal his word to you the Lord's going to equip his people tonight that's what he said to me but you got to hold on to it you've got to keep it you've got to recognize it as the word of the Lord Hallelujah. so the other day when I went back to the doctor because I didn't feel well what I felt was exactly what I felt the last time when they said I had cancer. And so I said to myself, I'm not going to go now. I'm going to wait till after the parade. And then I'm going to go check it out because I don't want bad news before the parade, you know. And I didn't really tell anybody, of course. Just a couple of my friends. Here. And... I went to the doctor and I sat on the table and they did all their ultrasounds and stuff like that. And I heard myself, Ryan, telling the doctor, I know there's a mass. I know it. I feel it. You don't have to tell me that. I'm telling the doctor like if I'm the doctor. And she goes and she reads the charts and stuff and she comes back and she has the most confused look on her face. And she says, well, I have a problem with, I, 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 I don't know why the Lord makes it happen this way. She said, there's something about what you're saying that doesn't make sense to me. And I said, what is it? She says, there is no mass. The next words were the best ones. Listen to this. She said, not even a small one. She said. I promise as God hears my testimony tonight she says there's nothing there not even a small I sat there with my legs dangling off her bed and I said to myself why do I never have my phone on when you people walk into the room to tell me that one more time God has shown up and done what no other person could ever do I had a stone for that he did it before and if he did it before i'll do it again all the people that are going to be praying for people i just want you to come up here because i'm going to give you instructions as the lord gave it to me tonight we're not going to intercede a long time for you because today you get to take it or leave it you understand they put up they put an armor on david that belonged to a king they put a weapon that looked great on David. And David said, I never use this. I can't wear this. Just give me what I'm used to. Give me what I've been through. Give me what I know about. Give me what I'm familiar with. God is saying, stop despising what you grew up in. Stop despising the things I've put you through. Stop despising what I've allowed you to overcome. Because that thing becomes your weapon. You understand? It is not meant to cut you and hurt you it is meant to cause you to, to slay giants do you understand you can take down giants that normal people can't take down because what you've been through normal people have not been through what you've been through makes you feel weak and God says you're not weak he said, what I've done is given you a weapon that could take down any giant. Let me give you a stone right now. Look at me. Fear not. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Every giant of fear in your life right now will fall in the name of Jesus. Every giant of fear will fall. Come closer. Let me tell you what you're going to do. So we're going to speak for the Lord tonight. That's what I hear him say. That means you don't have to make it up, but you have to listen intently. If you equip the wrong people with the wrong stone, they will not be able to overcome what the enemy is bringing their way. There are different people assigned to different giants. That's just how it is. Saul could not kill that giant he could not kill Goliath Saul was responsible for the slaying of a thousand David for tens of thousands and that's why God's saying don't judge by their stature don't judge by what you know about them close your eyes and as you go to them let the Spirit of God drop the word in you and as he puts the word in you you release the word to them 
and you, when you get it, it might not fit. Listen, just because it doesn't fit you today, you put it in the bag and you wait for the giant to show. Do you understand what God is saying? He's saying, what I'm giving you tonight is going to take down your enemy. What I'm giving you tonight is going to give you a victory that will cause you to become visible in the sphere that you need to be visible in. Do you understand? If David didn't take Goliath down, he would never become king. You understand? So if God, if you're like, I don't want no giants, you never become king without the giant. And God's saying the giant is going to come. But what I'm about to equip you with tonight will give you the power and the authority to take him down. And then God elevates you to what he meant for you to be. Does that make sense? It's a process. But it's a safe one. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be afraid because the enemy will come against you with swords and spears. But you will come against him in the name of Jehovah Sabah. Amen. I'm not a sure, baby. I'm gonna give me some oil and let's do this. Does anybody have oil? Hallelujah. Spirit of the living God, I thank you, Father, for great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You are, Father, everything. You are the chief cornerstone. And today, O oh God, I pray for an empowering. I pray for Holy Spirit, for you to touch their lips with the coals from the altars of heaven. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that there is a direct connection, an open heaven, a pipeline between heaven and earth, O oh God, that their words, Father, will be quick and powerful, O oh God, and sharp than the sword I declare today that the stone that is going to be released from the mouth of your servants father will pierce the, the forehead of every enemy of every giant that tonight giants will come crashing down in the name of Jesus and then when people ask us what's that stone for we'll know exactly which giant it was meant to slay in the name of Jesus thank you Lord go friends is good. Is good.